So um, I'm um, obviously uh, greatly honored to be one of the speakers at this um, absolutely tremendous uh, conference. Um, so my collaboration with uh, Jean has started um, about three and a half years ago. Uh, back then, we both caught fire on uh, one of um, Jean's favorite problems, I believe, and that is about uh, improving the LP estimates of um, the Eigen functions for the Laplacian on the torus. And uh, we analyzed the problem using various methods, a little bit of number theory, um, a little bit of um, uh, discrete incidence geometry, and um, then we started to realize or hope that perhaps uh, this inequality is part of something um, grander, and um, indeed that was the beginning of um, rather fruitful collaboration. The years that followed um, uh, brought me a lot of uh, joy and uh, satisfaction, and um, I'm uh, certainly one of many whose life has been uh, changed rather dramatically by the collaboration with John, and for that I'm obviously very grateful. So I'm gonna talk about uh, this joint work, and I'm gonna illustrate um, with one particular example in the end, uh, the Vinogradov mean value theorem, where um, actually Larry Guth has joined the team and uh, made things possible. Um, so I think every talk should have an easy slide, and if it's the first one, then it's perhaps even better. And I hope this slide is very easy to uh, digest. Um, so I'm gonna illustrate what we call decouplings by giving you um, a hierarchy of examples, which is going to become um, I think a little bit more serious towards the end. Um, but you know, to start with, let's talk about the most ab abstract scenario. Let's, let's think about uh, the Banach space example, right? So you have a thing called uh, the triangle inequality, and if you don't have any uh, further knowledge on the elements of the Banach space, all you can say is that um, you know, if you combine the triangle inequality with, um, let's say, the, the Cauchy Schwartz, um, and if you want to write the right-hand side not as an L, little l1 norm, but as a little l2 norm, then there is this factor here, right, the n to the power one and a half. That's the best, actually, you can say in general. So this is not very interesting. You can't do too much uh, with this inequality. But if X happens to be a Hilbert space, think about the case of L2 on the, on the torus, and if the elements, um, if the functions in this case happen to be uh, orthogonal, then you get something uh, more meaningful, you know, something rather sharp and useful. And this is what we want to call um, a little l2 uh, decoupling, right? So this is already a meaningful inequality. It's uh, very easy. So you wanna think about other spaces, the non-Hilbert space. And indeed, uh, there are plenty of examples um, in the non-Hilbert space scenario. So, by the way, I'm gonna denote by E of Z the um, exponential associated with um, a real frequency Z. And here's a lovely example that uh, I think is well known. Uh, the space X now is L4. And uh, it turns out that the squares are um, separated enough, uh, or have enough geometry, if you want, so that you actually have um, almost an L4 decoupling, there is an n to the epsilon loss. Uh, an interesting question, uh, probably very difficult, is to prove that actually if you go uh, below four here, slightly below then, uh, the n to the epsilon loss uh, could be removed. But you know, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, so how do you prove such a result? Well, use the fact that four is an uh, even integer. That's crucial. You expand the fourth power, you end up with uh, added quadruples. Um, and at the end of the day, it's uh, all about uh, how many lattice points do you have on a circle of radius n, and uh, we know there aren't too many, um, and that, that makes it possible. There is a second example 
which uh, historically speaking uh, has played a you know, crucial role in mathematics. Um, so note, by the way, that um, you know, there is a discrete nature to these examples. I'm gonna connect um, the abstract theory with the discrete theory in, uh, in a few slides. Uh, but for now, let's look at the lacunary case, right? So rapidly uh, growing sequence such as uh, two to the J. Um, and in this case, um, you have a very uh, strong decoupling. It holds actually for all the P's uh, between one and infinity. Um, and um, it has to do with the uniqueness of representations of integers in, in, in base two. Um, this is what's behind uh, the so-called little Paley theory, uh, which played a tremendous role in mathematics, not only harmonic analysis, but also PDs. So that should already be a, an indication that these kind of decouplings are, are important in mathematics. All right. Um, so there were, there were at least two pieces of work that uh, we found inspiring and that you know, gave us hope, that put us on the right track um, when, when our collaboration has started. Uh, the first one, historically speaking, is due to Tom Wolfe. Um, goes back to late 1990s. And Tom was interested, I think, primarily in the so-called uh, local smoothing conjecture for the wave equation, and he came up with the first uh, decoupling for the cone. Uh, and that was the cone in three dimensions. Um, the range that he got at that point uh, was not that impressive. I think P uh, greater than 74, and the sharp range is uh, P larger than six, but the methods that he has introduced actually were quite remarkable. It's a long paper, fairly technical, but it already, what already trans transpires from, from his approach is that there is a strong connection um, between um, these decouplings and incidence geometry. And indeed, one of the uh, tools that he has used in his approach was um, some sort of an implicit bound on the number of so-called circle tangencies. In how many ways can circles be tangent to each other? So this is a curved version of the Semmerdi Trotter theorem, if you want. Um, all right, and the second piece of work was uh, Jean's work from um, about 2011, if I recall correctly. That was a very uh, surprising piece of mathematics, not only for me, but you know, I think for everybody that has taken a look at it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, on the next slide, but essentially Jean proved a decoupling, an honest L2 decoupling inequality for hypersurfaces um, with um, um, positive definite fundamental form um, in, in, in some range, in the so-called stein thomas range. And um, well, that's how we essentially got started. We wanted to push the theory all the way up to the end point and uh, here is how um, an abstract, our sort of typical decoupling theorem looks like. So you have a manifold, um, think about as being a simple, you know, graph manifold compact, it has to be curved. This theory depends heavily on curvature. Um, it doesn't work for, uh, for, you know, hyperplanes, for example. Um, and what you want to do is you want to partition the manifold into caps, right? So for all practical purposes, imagine that you have the sphere in three dimensions. You fix delta, the frequency scale, and then you partition your uh, sphere into delta by delta caps, okay? Then you have a function which lives on um, the manifold, and uh, I'm going to denote, you know, for every cap, I'm going to denote by f sub tau the um, the restriction of the function to that cap. And then <clears throat> uh, the theorem says that there is a critical index greater than two, um, and there is a rather mysterious Q for the moment. So the Q is going to go into, into, into this part of the uh, uh, inequality, such that uh, if you look at the Fourier transform of this measure, right, so f is a function on the manifold, uh, d sigma is the uh, natural uh, measure on the manifold, uh, 
uh, sort of the pullback measure from the from the Lebesgue uh, measure in, um, in in Rn minus one, um, and obviously you can write this guy as the sum of all these pieces, right? So you can play again the silly game of using the um, uh, triangle inequality on the Minkowski inequality, and then followed by cauchy schwartz and you're going to lose a, a big power of delta, but um, the decoupling theorem says that no, due to some cancellations between the various regions on the sphere, actually the two things um, are, well, I mean, there is an upper bound which only involves at most delta to minus epsilon. All right, so there are two, uh, two things that I would like to discuss in, in this theorem. I mean, two uh, numbers. Uh, one is the, the critical index, um, and the other one is uh, Q. So. This says that you have to um, integrate on large enough balls, okay? And typically Q is, is greater than one. Um, and that's, that has to do um, with the, 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 somehow the scaling of the manifold. So I'll say a few words, uh, a few words in, um, in, in the future, okay? Any question at this point? Sorry? Yeah, I mean, the trivial is epsilon equals one half. Or maybe uh, one because there's delta squared. I mean, de depends on, you know, the dimension of the manifold. All right. <clears throat> so, um, why do we care about the couplings? Well, um, I already told you why, why Tom, Tom Wolf, uh, cared about the couplings. Um, but there were other reasons that were known to Jean. And that has to do with exponential sums. So, you know, here is a, um, you know, typical exponential sum estimate in, in our language. You can call it discrete decoupling. You can also call it a reverse holder. So what you have here is you have the same manifold. You have the caps, but now you select exactly one point from each cap, okay? And you don't care about the location, the precise location of that point. You don't care whether it's a lattice point or not. You don't care whether it's the center of the cap or not. It's just any point in that cap. And what I'm writing here is nothing else than the reverse Hölder inequality in disguise, right? Uh, you average over the size of the ball. This thing is nothing else than this expression uh, with p equals two. And this kind of inequalities are, are rather important in, uh, in mathematics. So, you know, this is a potential uh, application. Now you have the abstract decoupling theorem. How do you get from here to here? Well, this was uh, Jean's simple, but again, remarkable observation um, from a few years ago. Well, there is an easy transition. You can aim for much more in some sense, right? And what you get as a rather immediate consequence is a discrete decoupling. What do you do? Well, you have to apply this inequality to the function, which is a um, weighted, um, weighted sum of Dirac deltas. Of course, the Fourier transform of a Dirac delta is an exponential, and you know, the application is, is, is pretty immediate, okay? So this is what makes, um, I think, decouplings um, uh, attractive to, to number theorists, let's say. And let me talk a little bit about the, the zoo of, um, of these graph manifolds. Um, so, you know, again, typically we are looking at a manifold parameterized by, by D parameters. It's D-dimensional inside that N. And here's what's reasonable to expect um, in terms of critical exponents um, for, um, for this case. So <clears throat> it turns out that if the dimension of the manifold is large enough, greater than n over three, then the critical exponent as a function of n and d is given by this formula. And uh, there are manifolds which sort of achieve, uh, you know, this uh, critical exponent. You, by, by the way, you need some, um, some non-degeneracy conditions which um, are rather hard to describe depending on the dimension and co-dimension. Uh, so I'm not gonna get into that. There's a lot of linear algebra and uh, part of this is just expectations. It's not like we have theorems, but you know, we have theorems in some cases. So you can actually realize this with the purely quadratic manifolds. Think about the paraboloid or, um, yeah, I think that's probably the best example. Um, 
And in that case, the critical exponent is actually the so-called Stein-Thomas uh, exponent from restriction theory. Um, so this is the case, um, oh, sorry, th that's the case for hypersurfaces. So this is perhaps the uh, most telling example when the dimension is n minus one. But as the dimension of the manifold gets smaller, so in this range, for example, the cubic terms um, would, would, would uh, start uh, to impact uh, the theory. And then what you expect is the critical exponent to be three times four. And also the Q, the Q that dictates how large the spatial balls uh, should be, the Q is, is, is three in this case. It was you know, two uh, in the earlier case. So I'm illustrating this with some examples. Here's the um, uh, curve that plays a role in the Vinogradov mean value theorem. In R7, you could think about some product manifolds, right? So again, the cubic terms uh, will uh, uh, play an important role. And, and then the story is, is pretty clear. If, if D is between our N over five and N over four, you expect uh, this to be four times five. So we're gonna see these numbers again when um, I talk about uh, Vinogradov. Okay, so in this regime, of course, the fourth order terms will, will play a role and so on, okay? Um, so somehow we only understand very well the extreme cases, the case of hypersurfaces and curves. And uh, I'm describing here some of the successes of, of, of our theory and I'm um, hiding mostly because of uh, lack of uh, room on this slide. Um, many other uh, uh, papers and uh, nice results by Jean from, from the last two years. But let's briefly go over what we have. So in the case of hypersurfaces that I mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, it's important to have non-zero uh, Gaussian uh, curvature, uh, that was the first result that we proved and part of the motivation came from the application to uh, three hearts estimates for the Schrodinger uh, equation on um, rational and also irrational tori. So this problem um, has been investigated for the past 20 years before our work with um, a lot of number theoretical methods. Well, it turns out that um, uh, we get the expected sharp estimates by using uh, essentially just Fourier analysis. And then uh, we also got uh, progress on, uh, on this problem that I mentioned earlier, even though um, I think we are stuck uh, for a good reason, I think, Probably solving this problem will probably involve some number theory. Um, the cone is a bit more delicate because of the zero curvature. You expect a different critical exponent, so the cone somehow behaves like the lower dimensional sphere that uh, generates the cone. So this is, this is the Stein-Thomas index in lower dimensions. Um, we also were able to uh, use more or less um, the theory for, for the sphere as a black box and, and uh, complete close the gap um, in the case of the cone. Um, there's many, many applications that I don't have time to, to talk about. One of them is um, um, some partial progress on, on, on Chris Zog's uh, local smoothing conjecture. But also, as Peter has mentioned um, yesterday, um, there is this nice paper by, by Jean and Watt on uh, mean square estimates for the Riemann zeta. So you can do lots of things with, um, with a cone. Um, another cute application is uh, sort of in the intermediate range is the case of uh, two-dimensional surfaces in R4. So these are neither hypersurfaces nor, nor curves. And um, uh, Jean was able to use um, this theory to uh, improve the world, lack, world record in, um, um, about the, the Lindelof hypothesis the growth of the Riemann zeta on the critical line. And uh, most recently, uh, as I said, with uh, uh, Jean and Larry also, we finalized the theory for curves with torsion in, in our end. The critical exponent there is n times n plus one. Um, and as an application, we uh, proved Vinogradov's mean value theorem in all uh, the dimensions. Any question? So let me give you some insight on why we have to work on, on um, fairly large uh, uh, spatial balls. So think about k equals one, right? So again, the caps have size delta, so delta is very small. 
And what happens if you integrate on balls uh, of radius delta to minus one, right? Um, it turns out that the alpha the theory is okay, okay? And that's, by the way, the limitation of, um, of, of the theory. You can make the, the size of the ball smaller because of the uncertainty principle. But, you know, even averaging on these small spatial balls, you can say that the alpha norm is controlled by the little alpha norm. And by the way, in order to, um, in order for this to be true, you don't need anything else than the separation between the frequency points, okay? The separation comes from selecting just one point uh, on each cap, but you don't need the points to sit on a manifold. This is true even on, a, on the real line, essentially, where there is no curvature. However, um, if you wanna keep things at this level of generality, right, no curvature and uh, no large balls, this is the best you can say. You cannot replace the, uh, the L2 norm here with an LP norm where P is larger than two, okay? This is, you know, the, the end of the story for, for uh, Q equals one. But what if you uh, work with a Q which is um, uh, slightly greater than one? So let's add curvature, right? Let's assume now that the points um, lie on a sphere. And let's look at this critical exponent, which I mentioned earlier. But instead of averaging on, on larger balls, let, let's, let's keep the ball unchanged, right? So I, I have a bunch of um, um, exponential, you know, a bunch of frequencies on the sphere, and I want to integrate here. What, what happens? Well, it turns out that the best you can say is uh, this inequality, okay? So there is a delta to a negative power which um, makes uh, this number too large. And uh, this has been known for a while. It's equivalent with a particular case of the restriction theorem, the so-called uh, uh, Stein-Thomas restriction theorem, which as far as I know was the first case that was proved, uh, early 70s. And um, right, so that tells you that you cannot have decouplings on, on these um, uh, very small balls. However, the magic happens if in addition to having separation, um, curvature, and curvature, you also uh, increase the size of the ball. So if you look at the um, balls with radius delta to minus two, then um, you get delta to minus epsilon, okay? So uh, this says, uh, or illustrates the fact that while decouplings sort of belong to the landscape of, um, you know, restriction theorems, there is a distinctive uh, feature um, that, um, that they have compared to uh, restriction theorems. Um, so just to recap, in order to run our theory, we need separation, curvature, and large enough spatial balls. So I would like to add another slide um, to illustrate actually uh, the difference, or maybe the connection also, between uh, restriction theorems and uh, decouplings. And here's that slide. Um, so this is our decoupling theorem that I mentioned earlier for the sphere, and here's the Stein-Thomas range. And then I wanna look at a square function estimate. So the setup is the same, you have a function on the sphere, you have the same caps, except that instead of doing the um, little L2 of LP norm on the right, I'm choosing the LP of little L2 norm on the right. Well, it has been conjectured that this should be true. However, this is open in um, dimensions three and higher. And this is a very difficult conjecture. If you prove this, then you automatically have, um, I mean, okay, not automatically, but you know, uh, there, is, there is a rather short argument which shows that this would imply the full restriction conjecture and hence also the Kakea problem. So, you know. Don't give this to your grad students. Um, um, it's probably beyond the reach of, of, of current technology. So this is very hard, but notice also, that, you know, even if you prove it, okay, even if you prove it, uh, there is, you know, this range which is smaller than what we have. So somehow, you know, each, each theory should have some, some sort of a magic, some sort of a, you know, magic help, right? Um, and the help we get here is that um, we, we ended up proving or being able to prove something easier, 
right? This is easier than, than the square root function estimate. But we also gained uh, some, uh, something, right? Uh, the, the range in which this easier theorem holds true is larger. And by the way, in case I haven't uh, made that clear, this part is always smaller than uh, this part. This is what makes the decoupling easier than the conjecture. It, it, this is just an application of, of Minkowski's inequality. Okay, so here's something that we can prove. It has exactly the same consequences um, for um, exponential sums, and it actually has some, some new stuff, okay? It has a larger range, right? So that's magic, I guess. <laughs> All right, so now let me illustrate, uh, before I talk about proofs, uh, let me illustrate um, the decouplings with one example. Um, well, I think it's not just one example, it's probably the most pleasing uh, achievement of, of our theory and the most recent one. Um, so I'm gonna fix a few parameters here and then I'm gonna count the number of solutions for a system consisting of n equalities, right? When n equals two, you have this simple looking system. And the question is how many solutions do you have between one and n? There is an old conjecture which says that uh, this is the correct upper bound apart from epsilon uh, losses, which may or not, may not be there. And um, the way, right, so it looks like number theory, right? So, you know, you wanna tag this, you know, with, with analysis and luckily uh, there is an exponential sum uh, representation as an integral. Um, and this is the entry point uh, for, for analysts. Uh, so here's the theorem or the conjecture. So by the way, it's called uh, Vinogradov's means value theorem, but you know, it used to be a conjecture until recently. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history. So for some reasons that elude me, um, the you know, theorem, I mean, the, the conjecture was called a theorem. Um, so um, I'm illustrating here the two different regimes. There is a critical exponent. Something happens between uh, two and the critical exponent you recognize this number as being the L2 norm of this expression, so this is another reverse Hölder, and then for P greater than the critical exponent, there is some, uh, some losses which, which should be there. And, um, well, this estimate is fairly trivial at P equals two and P equals infinity, and if you can prove it for the critical exponent, then you can use Hölder, and um, you, you get the, the whole theorem. So it's all about the critical exponent. Yeah. So it, it looks to me like the second estimate, which is being p is higher, is basically saying that all the contribution functions of the integer are zero to order two, and then there's nothing left over. Is there a second, is there a mixed decomposition for the first estimate? Or what, what does that integral have? Um, well, I mean, um, I know how to use your, uh, let's say, a way of interpreting things, but, uh, the way I look at it is just as being the alto norm, essentially, so. What's that? All right. Um, good, so we have to look at the critical exponent. And let me um, warm, you, warm you up with the um, you know, easy case, n equals two. This has been known for a while. Uh, so the critical exponent in that case is, uh, is six. Um, the expected number of solutions is uh, n cubed. Um, so there are these, you know, trivial solutions. You can always um, choose x1, x2, x3, and then permute um, things. Uh, so up to permutation, you know, um, you know I mean, you, you get, you get the, the trivial solutions. There's about n cubed of them, maybe six times n cubed or so. And somehow this theorem says that uh, these are essentially all the solutions. Um, how do you prove this? You can easily manipulate this into something that, again, looks like, you know, the number of lattice points on a circle, and of, of course, there's at most n to the epsilon of them, um, and you win. But, um, you know, this argument, this simple looking argument is very efficient in, in, in two dimensions, but it, it seems to fail dramatically in, in higher dimensions. I mean, the counting problem becomes, um, you know, using, using algebraic varieties becomes 
more difficult, I think, than the original problem. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, folklore. You know, I learned about this cute argument from one of Jean's papers, um, that one of the GAFA papers from, I think, 93, uh, but you know, probably was known to, to other uh, groups. So the question is, what do you do? You have to do something new in, in higher dimensions. And until recently, only partial results were known. Uh, so I'm mentioning here, I'm you know, not mentioning many people because of lack of time, but you know, I'm mentioning the work of the original work of Vinogradov, Karatsuba, and uh, Stechkin. Uh, they proved that for P large enough, you know, in the sub supercritical regime, um, you have the correct estimate. They were even able to say something about the implicit constant, know that there is no um, n to the epsilon loss. And then much later, uh, four years ago, Trevor Woolley um, developed um, the efficient uh, congruency method, and that led to some, some rather significant progress. He was able to prove the theorem in uh, three dimensions for all values of P, and also got some partial progress in um, uh, higher dimensions. Um, and here's our theorem. So we were able to um, uh, prove the theorem in, in, in all the dimensions. And uh, if you look at our decoupling theorem, there is a delta to the epsilon loss, which translates into an n to the epsilon uh, loss. However, um, by using you know, the contribution um, of, of the major arcs, by using a little bit of number theory, we actually can, um, can, can remove that uh, the loss. So this is, in some sense, a sharp result. It's not sharp in the sense that we don't understand the exact value or even the asymptotics of, uh, of this constant. And that causes some, um, some, some headaches for, for number theorists. Um, if you understand more about this constant, then you can say something about the zero free region of the Riemann zeta. So the moment this uh, application is um, somewhat out of reach. However, there are at least two other important applications uh, that have been uh, documented, and uh, you can find a nice uh, exposition um, in uh, one of uh, Trevor's papers. So let me talk briefly about those. So one of them is about the so-called uh, vile sums. Uh, these are concerned with understanding uh, pointwise estimates for uh, these exponential sums, and the classical uh, result um, um, of, of vile says that, you know, if you're on a major arc, then you have a certain um, upper bound for um, for this exponential sum. Now notice that uh, this is smaller than one, so the larger this exponent is, the better. And uh, one of the consequences of our theorem is that you can actually make a rather dramatic leap from um, geometric to polynomial. And this is now the best known result for vile sums, at least for large enough n. Another application uh, concerns uh, the so-called warring problem. I'm going to denote um, by R sub SK of N the number of representations of N integer N as a sum of um, S, exactly S kth, uh, kth powers. And there is a certain um, heuristics um, that uh, leads to this asymptotic formula for large enough N. The big question is, um, to prove that this actually holds true as, as uh, expected heuristically for S precisely greater than K plus one. Um, so let's, um, for the sake of uh, describing progress on this problem, denote um, by G tilde of K, uh, this worrying number, the smallest S for which uh, this holds true. It's expected again that this worrying number is uh, K plus one. So let's see what, what's known about it. So uh, Trevor has showed that if you assume the mean value theorem, then um, you get this kind of bounds. And now that we have the mean value theorem, uh, these estimates are um, the best known, at least for um, k greater than four. For k equals three, the best known is still due to uh, Vaughn. It's about 30 years old. Um, and I wanna say that um, Further improvements are possible, and uh, Jean has um, made a very nice observation in the months that uh, followed um, our proof. He realized that he can improve on Hua's lemma, which I'm gonna have on the next slide, and if you uh, use this improvement, then you can um, push a little bit, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the logarithmic term to actually a linear term. <coughs> 
Okay, so I assume not everybody's, um, yeah. Sorry, do, do, do they? Do you need it for your group in Cambridge uh, of uh, this yoga? Um, so this part here is Woolies. Um, yes, so okay. right? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I never tracked exactly what goes into this. So, so maybe. In Germany, it's all in Vietnam. No, no. Kevin no, probably can answer it. This better than me. Glad to have you guys around. Thank you. Um, all right, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, who was Lemma because it's, it's, it's a surprising result, okay? It's some sort of a reverse Hölder inequality, but uh, you could think about it as being in the absence of curvature, right? So it, this thing happens on the real line. What is curvature on the real line? You don't have, um, don't even have subspaces, right, to talk about. Uh, so here's this exponential sum. The conjecture is that um, this holds true for p large enough. When p equals n, you can think about this as um, comparing the LP norm with the L2 norm. And Hua uh, proved this inequality in uh, some range, which again has to do with um, uh, you know, 2 to the n. So it's, it's, it's a large, um, it, it's rather far away from the critical exponent. Um, and then Jean was able to use our decoupling theorem, actually not for the classical curve, tt squared uh, and so on, but for some uh, perturbation of it, right? So that's another thing. Uh, our theory is um, well behaved under perturbations. And he was able to prove the sharp result from essentially two to the n uh, all the way up to um, n squared, okay? And, uh, Right, so probably, again, going beyond this would require some number theory, but getting this estimate is only using decouplings and um, uh, periodicity of exponential sums. It doesn't use any, anything serious on, on the number theoretical side. All right, so let's see. Um, this is the discrete consequence of our decoupling theorem for the curves. And it says that if you have a bunch of frequencies which are delta separated sitting on this curve, right? So now your curve is uh, compact, so it's between zero and one. Then for every P in the subcritical regime, if you integrate on large enough balls, and in this case Q is lil n, right? It's very important. So it's equal to two for the parabola. Right, so the parabola you can also think about as being a hypersurface in R2, and hypersurfaces are associated with uh, Q equals two, but in three dimensions, this is no longer a um, hypersurface, obviously it's a curve, right? So that's why you need to um, uh, change uh, these numbers accordingly. And again, it has to do with the, the way that the curves uh, scale. Um, but notice that, again, these frequencies don't have to be of the form i over n, right? They could be any frequencies, but in particular, if you choose them, um, you know, if you rescale the integers and choose, you know, x equals of the form uh, j equals uh, j, j over n, and if you change variables uh, into this inequality, um, then you arrive at something that involves exponential sums, you know, a la Vinogradov, Right, so you are mapping points from zero, one into, into integers, except that because of the change of variables, um, you are um, facing an integration over a large, rather large domain. So C here is a product of uh, <coughs> intervals. You wanna convert this into the n-dimensional torus. So how do you do that? Well, you just observe that you can decompose, you can tile actually this set with um, copies of the higher dimensional torus and then use the periodicity and you win. All right, and um, this part here is all the number theory that we're using, okay? So, I guess the, the moral is that uh, Vinogradov's mean value theorem is a theorem in analysis. Um, damn it, we can't say that we scored in number theory with this one, right? It's really, 
a theorem which can be formulated and proved within the fr framework of free analysis. Um, we also recover a slightly more general result in the sense that we allow coefficients and um, in the historical investigation of the mean value theorem, um, people were, you know, typically were able to, to, to attack exponential sums with coefficients one, you know, our theories, um, um, you know, producing or um, is, um, is working equally well for, for arbitrary coefficients. And um, I guess I want to say, I want to use the remaining uh, few minutes to, to give you some hints about how to prove um, um, the, the abstract decoupling theorem that's behind uh, the exponential sums that, that I uh, talked about. So for simplicity, let's uh, limit ourselves uh, to, to three dimensions. If you understand three dimensions, at least, um, you know, um, through, through the lenses of our work, then, then you also understand four and higher dimensions. Uh, so the transition, the, the, the important transition was from two to three in our case. <coughs> and again, the critical exponent is uh, three times four, which is 12. You tile the curve or you partition the curve using arcs of length delta, and you want to integrate on balls of radius um, delta to minus three, and you want to show that there is no um, important loss here. I mean, in, in a nutshell, the proof goes as follows. You start with something um, uh, trivial. This inequality is trivial when delta is roughly one, and you gradually enhance that inequality to something less and less trivial until you actually prove the theorem. And you do that by simultaneously increasing uh, the radius or the radii of the spatial balls and decreasing uh, the size of the arcs. And how do we achieve that? Well, we have uh, a few tools. So I, s I try to, to split the analysis into um, a few um, um, you know, separate themes. Um, so we're using uh, <coughs> parabolic rescaling to start with, and we, we do that uh, uh, quite a few times uh, throughout the work. And um, the important thing here is that if you look at any arc on, on this uh, curve, um, you can apply an affine transformation and recover the whole curve, okay, uh, between uh, uh, zero and one. Then we also use uh, lots of induction of scales, and for those of you which are not familiar with um, what this means, I just included an extra line. Uh, you have scales, right, these frequency scales. You are trying to prove or improve uh, certain inequalities that hold true at that scale. You call C delta the, con the best constant which holds true for, um, for that inequality. And you're trying to relate C delta to C uh, delta to one half, right? See what's relation, what, what, what kind of gain can you make when jumping from one scale to the other? And um, obviously I, I should mention the fact that these were uh, techniques that were uh, pioneered and uh, used, you know, um, very efficiently, starting with the work of Jean from early 1990s. Uh, Terry and Larry have mentioned um, Jean's significant impact um, uh, in, in the restriction problem uh, in connection to, to uh, the Kakea problem. And um, a third uh, ingredient is this multilinear perspective, right? So we, we try to use a linear decoupling, but it turns out that it's very useful to look at the multilinear version. So you can isolate um, distinct regions on your manifold, which exhibit some sort of a transversality. In the case of the curve, it's, it's enough for the regions for the intervals or the arcs to be separated. But as you look at uh, higher dimension manifolds, you need um, more than that. You need um, uh, essentially the normal vectors to point in uh, um, um, you know, directions that essentially span the Rn. And this um, relies, I mean, making the interplay between linear and multilinear uh, decoupling theory uh, is made possible by another piece of uh, Jean's work with, with Larry about six years ago, the so-called, uh, you know, bourgain guth induction on scales. Um, and, right, so, it's not like we 
we can prove the multilinear decoupling theorem, but by relating them, by showing that the multilinear decouplings and the linear decouplings are essentially the same, we can use some sort of a bootstrap argument that gradually pushes both constants, both inequalities towards the, um, um, the correct uh, expected estimates. Okay, um, now there's a different way of looking at, at our methods, right? So we, we have to prove a decoupling, but um, in order to achieve the ultimate decoupling for curves, uh, you wanna use simpler versions of decouplings. And the simplest possible one is the one that I've already mentioned earlier, the so-called L2 decoupling. Notice that you have um, L2 here. <coughs> um, so this is in some sense a weak um, theorem, right? It's just orthogonality. However, it has a strength in the sense that if you fix, if you fix this ball, right? If you, that is to say, if you, if you fix the radius of the ball, then it allows you to decouple on the right-hand side into the smallest possible um, uh, intervals. The smallest possible, again, allowed by the uncertainty principle. So, you know, it's not an impressive tool, but um, g given the fact that we, we play this game of increasing the size of the spatial balls and same time decreasing the, the, the size of the intervals. Th this is a really neat uh, thing that we can afford every once in a while, right? We, we make the intervals uh, uh, rather small. Okay, on the more serious side, uh, we also use the lower dimensional uh, decoupling. And this is a bit strange to say. Um, if you think about hypersurfaces, then you can really think about lower dimensional subsets on those hypersurfaces, right? You have a sphere, you cut it with a hyperplane, you get a circle, and you kind of imagine that circle as being, um, you know, the lower dimensional manifold and, you know, running some sort of induction on, on dimension. Larry was also alluding um, to this kind of approach um, when he talked about the polynomial method. He had his um, uh, algebraic um, manifold and the tubes lying inside. This is a little bit different. It's actually a bit easier, okay? So what, what does it have behind, right? So imagine this twisted cubic, the tt squared t cubed, right? If you look at a small arc, let's say t between zero and delta on this twisted cubic, if you want to run a decoupling on spatial balls of radius delta to minus cubed, that amounts to smoothing on the frequency side um, with a, um, you know, delta uh, cubed kernel, right? So that amounts to essentially looking at delta cubed uh, neighborhoods of this arc. And it turns out that the delta cubed neighborhood of this arc is the same, more or less, as the delta cubed um, neighborhood of this arc. And what you recognize here, right? So the twisted cubic doesn't have enough time to, to get some, some height, right? It's, it's essentially planar which means that you can treat this part of the arc with lower dimensional theory. You can look at this as being a parabola. There is an L6 um, exponent there, and the bottom line is that you, you are able to decouple into rather small arcs because the Q is getting higher um, as the dimension N is getting larger. So this approach, th this, this tool has a weakness and a strength, and I've already mentioned them. The weakness comes from the fact that you can only do a reverse holder uh, between two and six, and the three-dimensional exponent is 12. The strength is, again, the fact that you can decouple into uh, much smaller intervals than, um, than you expect, in some sense. All right, any question? Okay, so we've seen the L2 decoupling, the lower dimension decoupling, and um, perhaps the, the heaviest uh, tool that we are using is um, this uh, multilinear Kakea uh, type uh, inequalities. Uh, Larry has already explained um, how to get from Fourier restrictions, uh, sorry, from, let's say, uh, Fourier transforms of measures uh, to, to wave packets, to, to, to tubes, to Kakea type inequalities. And we're using a whole hierarchy of um, this kind of multilinear inequalities, which uh, was clarified greatly through Larry's work uh, only in recent years. <coughs> It was nice to have these um, um, type of um, results available. Um, and I'm only presenting you briefly um, one of the results, perhaps the best known result, the first that was proved uh, historically, uh, chronologically, um, 
So this is uh, the result about um, tubes. So, you know, don't pay too much attention to what this inequality says, but um, perhaps pay attention to my hands, right? So you have a bunch of tubes in R3, and you actually have three families of such tubes, which correspond to directions specified by three transverse regions on the sphere. And you want to see how these tubes intersect with each other, right? So at the end of the day, you have functions, which are essentially weighted sums of characteristic functions of these tubes. And you want to say something meaningful about uh, the intersection between uh, these tubes. This estimate is sharp, um, has been proved uh, uh, 10 years ago. Um, extremely important result, you know, it has led to a lot of mathematics. Um, and we are so lucky to, to be able to, to rely, uh, you know, on, um, on these things. So this is, this is what makes the multilinear perspective, the multilinear decoupling useful, right? Um, so, um, right, and then um, there is, as I mentioned earlier, a whole hierarchy of things. You can replace the, the tube with the plates. So rather than having geometric or, or rectangular boxes, if you want, whose um, long side, you know, which, 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 which have only one side, one long side and um, n minus one um, small sides, you could imagine all sorts of intermediate creatures where um, maybe the long side is um, appearing, well, the, yeah, the long side is appearing n minus one times and uh, the short side only once. So, you know, in R3, it's the distinction between a book and a stick, I would say, right? Um, well, it turns out that this is the, the, the hardest to prove, the, the one that encodes most uh, geometric information. All right, so um, I only have one slide where I want to post some uh, cute open uh, questions. So let me know if you have um, um, any questions at this point before I'm going to ask you some questions. We are fine. All right, so let me go to the last uh, slide. So these open questions actually um, served, uh, at least for me, as, as, as a motivating uh, and inspiration, as a motivating factor and inspiration when, when I first started looking at uh, decouplings. And um, in some sense, you know, we, we answered, uh, using decouplings, we answered uh, the easy versions of these questions, but I think the hard and very interesting questions uh, are still remaining. Um, for a set A in an additive group, you denote by E sub n the generalized additive energy. This is to say <clears throat> the number of two n tuples such that the sum of the first n components is the same as the sum of the last n components. You are very familiar, I think, with uh, E sub uh, two. And then um, the first question is prove or disprove that for every set on the sphere, two-dimensional sphere in R3, um, prove or disprove that the two energy is at most um, <clears throat> S squared plus, plus epsilon. This is to say, if this is true, hmm? A squared. you're right, A squared two plus epsilon, thank you. So that would say that there aren't too many additive quadruples apart from the trivial ones, again. Well, uh, this theorem actually holds true if you replace the sphere with a parabolic, then in restriction theory, we're used to the interchanging the two things, right? If something holds for one, then supposedly it holds for the other one, and the proof shouldn't be much different, and that's what I thought um, initially. So a proof of this fact for the parabolic appears in our first paper with Jean, and the proof goes as follows. Look at an additive quadruple on the parabolic projected onto R2, and you're gonna get another quadruple, and if it's an additive quadruple, then the four points in R2 should sit uh, on a circle, and in fact, um, you know, they, they, they should form a rectangle, right? So they're gonna be uh, diametrically opposite, uh, two by two. Okay, so here's a rectangle, that means you have right angles, and then the question is, if I give you n points in the plane, how many right angles, what's the maximum number of right angles that you can achieve with those end points? There is a sharp result by Pach and Sharir, about 30 years old, which says that there can be at most n squared 
times log n, and that's sharp. Okay, so, you know, in that case, the plus epsilon can be replaced actually with a logarithmic factor. Well, try doing the same with the sphere. Um, the same is true, the four points on the sphere that form an additive quadruple are gonna sit on a circle, they're gonna be diametrically opposite, but now you face two things. You say, okay, I'm either gonna try to hope that the pach sharir result holds true in three dimensions, and that's false. There, there's more ways in which um, n points living in R3 can give rise to uh, right angles. Uh, or the other possibility is that you project them down to the plane using a stereographic projection, right? The problem is that the right angles are broken. Unless the four points sit on a big circle, the stereographic projection is gonna destroy uh, the right angles and um, here's, a, here's what makes this question uh, 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 difficult, I think, or interesting, okay? But there is some hope, right? It's true for the parabolic, you'd think it should be true for the sphere. So here's something more challenging. The, um, Right, so these two corresponds actually to a four, and that's the critical exponent for um, uh, decouplings. This is a stein thomas exponent, uh, um, you know, critical exponent for decouplings um, uh, in, in three dimensions. If you go in two dimensions, you think should be much easier. The critical exponent is six there, as you recall, and so you're looking at the three energy, and prove or disprove that given any endpoints on either the parabola or the circle, the three energy, um, cannot be larger than, I got this right this time, a to the power three plus epsilon. Well, I don't know how to prove this in uh, either case. Uh, Enrico Bombieri talked about um, the joint paper with Jean, where they have observed that the semi trotter produces this upper bound. Uh, in the case of the circle, same works in the case of the parabola. Um, it has been known that the unit distance conjecture um, would imply this, um, in the case of the circle. So this unit distance conjecture says that if you have n points in the plane, then they can determine at most n to the power one plus epsilon unit distances. And in case you wonder about the level of difficulty of that conjecture, that's known to immediately imply the um, 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 Guth cuts, uh, well, the Erdős distance problem that was solved by, by uh, Larry and, and Nets. So it's, it's a difficult one. Okay, and again, I'm repeating myself, uh, these statements are known to be true in the case when the points are, um, you know, have enough um, uh, separation. So if you don't enlarge the gaps between the points to be too large, uh, then they, they follow right away from, from our decoupling theorems. But because of the delta to minus epsilon losses that we have in our work, um, the general statements are, are open. Thank you very much. <laughs>